The subject of this week's Dark Side of the Ring, the second to last episode of the season, was WCW Bash at the Beach 2000. A show that included a wedding gown match and a graveyard match. But nobody remembers that. What they remember is the debacle involving Hulk Hogan, Vince Russo, and Jeff Jarrett. And Booker T winning his first WCW world title. And I thought I summed it up pretty well on Twitter the other day after I finished watching the episode. The only person that I have any real sympathy for coming out of this episode was Jeff Jarrett, who got caught in a situation having to lay down in the middle of the ring for Hogan. It was a situation that he did not want to be in. Vince Russo's whole shtick during his WCW run of breaking kayfabe and having the announcers go out on live television and shoot on people breaking scripts and deviating from the format and changing finishes on the fly, they would openly talk about this on the air, was incredibly stupid. It was embarrassing. Eric Bischoff, he's so far up Hulk Hogan's ass, I'm surprised his nose hasn't turned a permanent shade of brown. And then there's Hogan himself. Hogan is what he is. Hogan has always been about one person, that is Hulk Hogan. That's what's allowed him to stay on top as long as he's been on top for. We knew that from the Star K97 fiasco with Sting. That Hogan is all about Hogan. But I can't even blame him because at the end of the day, WCW was stupid enough to give him creative control. So they got what they deserved. It's not unlike Vince McMahon giving Bret Hart creative control in the last 30 days or 60 days or whatever it was of his contract. You can't give talent that power and then turn around when they use it and play the victim. And it's frustrating to watch this episode because all of these people, they're all arguing over something that is so trivial in the grand scheme of things. And I can only imagine how many bros the producers had to edit out of this episode. I will tell you that, and there's a bunch that slipped through. Imagine the ones that didn't. They earned their pay on this one. But I will say, it, it was kind of nice to get a breather this week from the usual drugs and death that we get on Dark Side of the Ring. This, this wasn't so much the dark side of the ring as it was the disgraceful side of the ring. But Bash at the Beach 2000 was another in a very long line of embarrassing moments that this company suffered through in the dying days. It wasn't the final nail in the coffin like some people might suggest, but it was one of the many nails that went into the coffin of a company that at one time was on top of the world. They were number one. They had Vince McMahon's back up against the wall, and then it all fell apart, largely due to their own mistakes. Although Vince McMahon and Vince Russo, to be fair, they had something to do with that too. And I will give Russo his props here at the start. He helped create a lot of very memorable moments during the Attitude Era that are still fun to go back and watch today. And, and he had the great fortune of writing television for people like Steve Austin and The Rock and Mick Foley and The Undertaker. They all would have become... The Undertaker was already a star, but you know, the other ones, they all would have become big stars regardless. But it was those moments, like Austin riding a Zamboni out to the ring or, or a beer truck or Kane's debut at Hell in a Cell, those moments still live on today. They're iconic. And it was part of Russo's philosophy of Crash TV. Crash TV over matches and work rate. You know, it was about the characters, it was about the moments, and it worked. There were a lot of ideas of his, I'm sure, that were shot down or had to be reined in by Vince McMahon. He acted as a filter of sorts, but they made a great team there for a while, and I am forever grateful that I got to grow up a wrestling fan during that time. The Monday Night Wars, I mean, you, you had to do that kind of stuff to stop people from flipping over to the other show. Eric Bischoff, you know, if he didn't push for the creation of Monday Nitro, we may never have seen any of the stuff I just mentioned. It was Nitro going live every Monday night and Bischoff putting the luchadors and the cruiserweights on TV and the NWO angle. All of that helped bring wrestling to the heights that it got to be in the late 90s. He found the right formula. He found the right mix. And then there's Hulk Hogan. I may not be a wrestling fan right now were it not for Hulkamania running wild in the 80s. So I recognize all of their contributions. But I can also sit here and say that doesn't make them good people or, or people whose word I would take as the gospel truth on anything. 
There's Russo's truth, there's Bischoff's truth, and then there's the actual truth, which falls somewhere in the middle. The main talking heads in this episode were Russo and Bischoff. Jeff Jarrett was interviewed, Hulk Hogan was not, because I'm sure he said no when they asked him. Booker T was not, because Booker has said he doesn't want to be on any of these shows if they're going to be negative. Dave Meltzer was interviewed, as was Lance Storm who worked for WCW at the time, although he had no direct involvement in what happened at Bash at the Beach. And this greatly bothered Vince Russo, by the way, who he saw an advanced copy of the episode on Monday, and he was on Twitter complaining about Lance Storm being included. He said, Besides the fact that Lance Storm has been personally attacking me for 20 years now, simply because he didn't agree with the way I presented professional wrestling, I have to ask, why was he part of Vice's Bash at the Beach? He had nothing to do with anything. He knew nothing. So why was he on there? Once you see it, you can answer that for yourself. It's just how shit works. You just have to be smart to it. You don't have to be smart to anything. He was on the show to give the perspective of somebody who was working for WCW at the time. On that roster. Who was watching like the other wrestlers were and had no idea what to believe. They were reacting to it just like just like the fans were. Because Russo's whole thing was, and maybe Bischoff's also, oh, let's work everybody. Let's work everybody, including the boys. So they don't know if it's real or not. Yeah, working the boys, all that does, it breeds distrust in the locker room. And I don't see how that's ever a good thing. But that was just one of the many reasons for all of the dysfunction in WCW at the time. But the other reason they probably interviewed Lance Storm and had him on the special was they interviewed Lance Storm probably for a few different episodes, including the Chris Candido one from earlier in the season. So when they sit these guys down, I'm sure they have a list of different topics and they're like, well, while we have him, (laughs) he was in WCW at the time. Let's ask him about this. So that's why they interviewed Lance Storm. Yes, he was not directly involved in any of this, but... He was looking on, probably wondering what the fuck is going on, just like the rest of us. Now, right from the start of the episode, we have Vince Russo telling us, goes, I despise the wrestling business, bro. I despise the people in it. You cannot be a good person and exist in the wrestling business. You can't, bro. So we already got a couple of bros here just from the beginning. Yeah, he says uh, there are no good people in the wrestling business, he says. Says the man who worked with Owen Hart, for example. You dumb bastard. He says he despises the people in the wrestling business. But at the very end of the episode, he says he doesn't hate anyone involved. In this or, or anything, because it was just a job to him. So we're already getting double talk. We're not even five minutes into the episode. Already the double talk is beginning. Then one of the producers asks Meltzer if he thinks Russo has done more harm or more good for pro wrestling. And the look on Meltzer's face was priceless. He, he sort of hesitated at first, and then he said harm. Long term, more harm than good. And I think that's a fair assessment. Crash TV in the short term might work, but when you do that and you hot shot everything, in the long term, you're making it more difficult to keep people tuned in. So yes, long term, I would say more harm than good. That sounds about right. You know, the best way that I would describe it is he offered something different at a time when they very much needed something different. Different does not necessarily mean good. Some of it was good. Some of it was not good. But it was a different approach at a time that they desperately needed a different approach. And it worked. But what worked back then is not necessarily going to work forever. That's what Vince Russo did. Vince McMahon was stuck in the mud. Bischoff saw an opening and he took it. You know, they showed us the formation of the NWO. They were off to the races at that point. That's when Vince McMahon elevated Russo, who up to that point had been writing for the magazine. He elevated him to a creative position and Russo explained what the concept of Crash TV was. He said it was preventing the viewer at home from changing the channel to see what was happening on the other show. He said the idea was short match, backstage segment, vignette, short match, fight in the back, and so on and so forth. That was the formula. He said they didn't want to give the viewer a chance to see what was going on on Nitro. And again, it made sense because Nitro was kicking their ass for over 80 weeks. They were trying to figure out a way to get people to stop tuning in 
and stopped changing the channel over to TNT. Now, by the end of 99, the glory period for WCW has, has long been over. They're losing money. Their budget was getting slashed. Bischoff was ousted from power. Meanwhile, WWE was adding two hours of television every week with SmackDown. Vince McMahon wanted Vince Russo to write SmackDown and Raw every single week. Him and Ed Ferrara. Russo goes to McMahon. And he tells him he wants to move his family closer to his wife's family because he's never home. And that's when Vince McMahon shot back with, well, Vince, you know, you you make enough money to pay for a nanny to watch your kids. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back for Russo. A week later, he was in WCW. And it was a big news story at the time when Russo and Ferrara, they jumped ship. So much so that WCW talked about their signing on the air, which was very awkward and unusual to be talking about the writers on your show on television like they were, like you would think they were these big talent signings. And it's like, no, we, we have a new creative team here in WCW. And, you know, you look at, at the beginning of the Russo era and some of the great ideas that either we got or almost got from Vince Russo during his WCW run. They included such things as Pinata on a pole with the Luchadors. A Judy Bagwell on a pole. Well, actually a forklift, but they said Judy Bagwell on a pole where Buff Bagwell would have to win if he wanted to get his mother back. Wanting to make Lance Storm Eric Bischoff's illegitimate son. Trying to make Tank Abbott a thing. And even wanting to make him WCW champion at one point. Turning Mike Awesome into the fat chick thriller. Turning Bill Goldberg heel in 2000. That's just a small sampling of some of the wonderful ideas. Yeah, making David Arquette the WCW champion, that was something that Arquette himself, as a wrestling fan, thought was a stupid idea. But in in fairness, that was actually a Tony Schiavone idea. Tony Schiavone is the one who came up with that idea. He pitched it to Russo. Russo was like, holy shit, I didn't even think of that. That's great. So Russo, in the end, he's the one that pushed it through. Nobody objected. And so we ended up with David Arquette as the WCW champion. But they were just they were trying to throw shit at the wall at that point just to see what would, what would stick. So there were a lot of terrible ideas. But one thing that Russo has said he wanted to do, his philosophy, was to get younger and focus less on the older guys like Hulk Hogan. Not, not get rid of them completely. But phase them down, push new stars. And I agree with him on that. The older names will only get you so far. Eric Bischoff noted that the narrative was that Hogan was too old and he had to retire. But that the business side of wrestling still found a lot of value in Hogan. That was proven true when he went back to WWE. You know, Hogan definitely still had value. There was money to be made with him. But he could not be the top star anymore. His time had come and gone. He was not the top dog. You know, when he, and and look, when he went to uh, WWE, he relented because I think he wanted to show that he could be a team player and he would, you know, I'm going to be on my best behavior. You want me to job to The Rock? I'll job to The Rock. You want me to job to Kurt Angle? I'll job to Kurt Angle. You want me to lose to Brock Lesnar on TV in a bear hug? I'll lose to Brock Lesnar on TV in a bear hug. But then by the end of 2002, he wanted to come back and beat Brock and get his win back for the belt at Madison Square Garden. That would have been ridiculous. So, Russo claims he wanted to move away from the big names, being in the main events. Even though, I do have to point out, he has admitted before to having had a meeting with the Ultimate Warrior after he came in to try to get him back into WCW. That was a year after that very short, very disastrous run that the Warrior had in 98. Russo comes in, one of the first things he does, let's go meet with the Ultimate Warrior to try to get him in. And you know damn well that if he had convinced the Warrior to come back, Warrior wasn't coming back to put over a bunch of mid-card talents that Vince Russo wanted to elevate. So I don't know what his grand plan would have been. I I think it was something about maybe pairing him up with Sting and kind of reuniting the Blade Runners. Whatever the Warrior would have been doing, I guarantee you he would not have been putting over people like Booker T on the roster. right? Or, Or another one of Russo's ideas. The new version of the NWO, the whole NWO 2000 thing. They were supposed to feud with Goldberg until Goldberg put his hand through a limousine window that ruined whatever plans they had. 
But running the NWO back for the gazillionth time, I failed to see how that would have helped get any new stars over. So October of 1999, Russo comes in. He says in the first three months, the ratings were up. Meltzer says month to month, they were down. In the Nitro book by Guy Evans, which I consider to be the definitive WCW book because it has the actual numbers in there for all sorts of things, and interviews with with Turner executives who, in a lot of cases, have never been interviewed about WCW before. It's a very comprehensive book, but it mentions that Nitro averaged a 3.25 Nielsen rating over the nine-week period prior to Russo and Ferrara coming in. It averaged a 3.21 rating over their first nine weeks after they came in, which ultimately ended with Russo being sent home in January of 2000. While still under contract, he was he was basically paid to sit at home. So less than four months after he signed with the company and came in, he was removed as the head booker and the head writer by Brad Siegel and Bill Bush. Russo was not interested in this idea of working as part of a booking committee, so they sent him home. And then they ended up bringing him back a few months later to work with Eric Bischoff because they didn't want to pay him just to sit at home and do nothing. And yes, the ratings did go down after Russo went home and they never recovered. Now, was that a product of his vision starting to work? Were the numbers going down and staying down a product of just finally driving away so many viewers that they were never going to come back? Probably a little bit of both. I know the Thunder ratings on Thursday started ticking up a little bit during those early Russo shows. Would it have lasted? Who knows? He was never going to recapture that the glory days that he had with WWE when they were posting fives and sixes every week on cable. But the numbers going down and staying down until the company died was a sign of just how much of a mess had been made of things by that point. Russo and Bischoff, they come together and they do a hard reset. They stripped all of the titles from all of the champions. They started this old versus new angle, the new blood against the Millionaires Club, which were all of the older veteran guys. Like a WCW Civil War. Russo said the whole thing was destined for failure. Eric wanted to be in charge again because he wasn't quite in that executive position he used to be in. So, you know, in his mind, Eric just wanted to be in charge again. Bischoff said he knew Russo was a bullshit artist. He wanted nothing to do with his ideas. (laughs) So, yeah, you're listening to this. This sounds like a wonderful working relationship between these two. We skip ahead to Bash at the Beach. Russo claims the week of the show, he's asking around in the production meeting, if you could make anybody the WCW champion right now, who would it be? And unanimously, everybody said Booker T. So Russo said, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put the belt on Booker T. David Penzer, he worked for WCW at the time. He was the, uh, the ring announcer. He has said that Terry Taylor told him to call Booker that Thursday before the show to tell him that he was winning the title and to tell him to bring a suit with him to Nitro that Monday. So the plan was to get the belt on Booker. I mean, this was something that was established at least days in advance. Jeff Jarrett was the champion at the time. He had beaten DDP to win the vacant belt back in April. Then he beat Kevin Nash at the Great American Bash. And the plan was for him to beat one more legend, that being Hogan, before dropping the belt to Booker. Russo says the main event for Bash at the Beach was penciled in as Jeff Jarrett against Booker T, with Booker going over, even though earlier on that same show, Jarrett would be defending the belt against Hulk Hogan. He says he wrote it to make sure Hogan looked strong in the match, but he was not going to win the championship. Bischoff says that he and Hogan had a different idea, and what Russo wanted didn't matter, because Hulk had creative control. And then we got Jarrett talking about there being a conflict of interest when talent has creative control in their contract. I fucking died listening to this, thinking back to the early days of TNA, that Jeff Jarrett would be railing against the idea of creative control and somebody putting themselves over. Now that's fucking funny. That's fucking funny. What happened is this. Russo's initial idea, two days before the show, as relayed to John Laurinaitis, to have Laurinaitis then relay it to Hulk Hogan, was that the match would end in a disqualification after outside interference. That would keep Hogan strong, but the belt would stay with Jeff Jarrett. 
That was an idea that Hogan immediately shot down. So Russo goes back to the drawing board. He has to, you know, script things all over again. His second idea was to book Hogan to look even stronger. And he would lay waste to more than one person. In the episode, he mentioned Scott Steiner. But still, in the end, there would be no title change. And according to Russo, he was told Hogan loved it. But then late in the day that Friday, this is the Friday before the pay-per-view, Hogan had his lawyer fax a letter to WCW offices. And it may have come in after hours when nobody was there, but he faxed a letter to WCW offices changing his mind on the outcome, letting them know. The fax in question never got to Russo, who got to the show that Sunday with no knowledge of any fax ever being sent because it was never relayed to him. He claims he was never even aware of the fax until the deposition in Hogan's lawsuit. The idea was Hogan would take the belt home with him. This would then set up a tournament to crown a new WCW world champion, prompting Hogan to make his big return right before Halloween Havoc. If not at Halloween Havoc, I've I've heard some conflicting language used, whether it would be on the pay-per-view or right before the pay-per-view, but let's say at Halloween Havoc. But it would result in a champion against champion match. So that's Bischoff's version of events as relayed to the guy, to, to Guy Evans for his Nitro book. Some parallels there to what AEW is doing right now with CM Punk calling himself the real world champion running around with a second belt. Russo's version is that they still could not come to an agreement on what to do. So he suggested, in front of Hogan and Bischoff, he claims, he suggested that he's going to cut a scathing promo on Hogan after the Jarrett match. And in that promo, he would set up a match between Booker T and Jeff Jarrett with Booker winning the belt. And the book summed it up pretty well this way, that the Hogan-Jarrett match ended up merging elements of the Montreal Screwjob, the Finger Poke of Doom, and the angle from Halloween Havoc the year before, where Hogan laid down for Sting in the middle of the ring and then he just walked out. I remember that. Hogan walked out in street clothes. They were playing his, you know, uh, Real American or American Made song. He comes to the ring and he lays down for Sting and Sting pins him and Hogan gets up and he leaves. That was the first pay-per-view of the Russo era. And it also happens to be one of the worst WCW pay-per-views of all time. Halloween Havoc 99. Seriously, he booked a Hogan versus Sting match for the title on pay-per-view and that is how it ended. So this finish here blended that and the others together in this sort of putrid soup of bad ideas. Bischoff disputes that Russo ever made such a pitch to him. Or to Hogan. He calls Russo a liar. Pot meat kettle. In the episode, it's an hour before showtime, and Russo is pissed. Because here he thought he had this DQ finish agreed to for the Jarrett match... And now Hogan wants to leave with the belt, and he's just, he's changing things. And this is the only point in the entire episode that I actually had some sympathy for Vince Russo. I had sympathy for the devil, as the Rolling Stones would say. Because I can feel the same frustration, just listening to the stories or reading these stories, hearing him talk about it, I can feel the same frustration that he was feeling at that time. And, and probably not even real. I'm sure what he was feeling was way worse because he was in the middle of it. But just listening to it, I was frustrated. Whether you think he's got good ideas or piss poor ideas, it's his job to write these shows. And here's Hulk Hogan at the 11th hour saying, that don't work for me, brother. And blowing things up. If there was a fax that Hogan's lawyer sent the Friday before, Russo didn't see it. So as far as he knew... They're changing plans on me right before showtime. It's got to be extraordinarily frustrating. So Russo goes to Jared. He tells Jeff, just lay down for him. Let him pin you. Let him take the belt. Jeff is dumbfounded by this. He thought it made no sense for Hogan as the babyface to win the belt that way. And he would be right. He told Russo, everyone loses in this scenario. Also correct. And he, he really struggled with whether he should even go out to the ring to do this. He says he thought about forcing Hogan to punch him and at least getting something resembling a physical match out of it. 
he was going over in his head what his options were and, you know, what would protect his family and his career. And he said he wasn't angry. He just wanted to get it over with. And Jarrett says he never looked at Hulk the same way again after that. The Undertaker said the same thing after the stunt that Hogan pulled on him at the Survivor Series in 1991. When Hogan convinced everybody that Undertaker had dropped him on his head for real on the tombstone when he really didn't. That could have killed this guy's career. He was only a year in the company by that point. And now he's shitting bricks, worried that, oh my God, I just killed the top star. So he confronted Hogan about it a few days later at TV when he finally saw a replay of the spot. And he saw, I think Shane McMahon may have been the one who told him, dude, like his head was nowhere near the mat. So then he sees it for himself. He confronts Hogan with it. Hogan tried to bullshit his way out of it. After that, Undertaker says he never looked at Hogan the same way again. And you can tell when he talks about Hogan, you know, he'll mention having respect for what he accomplished and everything, but it's very clear when you listen to The Undertaker talk about Hulk Hogan, he don't like Hulk Hogan. So Jarrett lays down. Hogan pins him with a foot on his chest. Russo tosses the belt into the ring. And Russo, in, in the episode, he notes that the crowd was confused. And Jarrett says the old saying is, if you confuse them, you lose them. People didn't know what to make of this. Then the announcers have to act like, oh, wait a minute, this wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't part of the script. This is fucking cringe to have to go back and listen to these WCW announcers. Wait, it's it's not in the format. This wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't part of the show. It's a fucking embarrassment. So the match is over. Hogan walks out with the bell. Bischoff says, so far, everything went according to plan. He and Hogan left the building with the belt. They went to the airport. They boarded a flight. They were giving each other high fives, and they felt like they had really accomplished what they set out to do. The plane lands about 30 minutes later. Hogan's phone is blowing up. Finds out Russo went out on the pay-per-view and cut a promo burying Hogan. He talks about Hogan in the promo. He talks about Hogan playing the creative control card. You know, Lance Storm says because of Russo's crazy booking style, the, the boys in the back, they still, they're still they not even sure if this was all part of the plan or not. He said if this was part of the plan, it's stupid, and if it's not, it's even stupider. Russo calls Hogan a piece of shit, promises we're never going to see him again. Russo then makes Jarrett against Booker for the world title as the new main event for the show, calls Hogan a big bald son of a bitch, and tells him to kiss his ass. So now the comments that Hogan is seeing online are all about how Russo finally put the screws to Hogan and he finally put Hogan in his place because people are buying into this as a shoot. And when Hogan reads this, he says, that's where things went south. That ba- Basically, Hogan worked himself into a shoot and he was very upset. Russo says everything on the show, including the scathing promo, is what was discussed in the trailer with him, Bischoff, and Hogan before the show. Bischoff says that was never his plan. It was never Hogan's plan. They didn't know Booker was walking out as the champion because Hogan had the physical belt and he was going to bring it back in October. Russo says it was part of the plan and the reason that Hogan had to leave the building was because it wouldn't have made sense for him to still be there and not come out and kill Russo the minute Russo started going out there and shooting all over him like that. And Bischoff says Russo may believe that, but that's why he's a pathological liar. He says nothing was approved by him or Hogan. He called it the most unprofessional thing that he has seen in 30 years of television. What's curious to me is that how can Eric Bischoff claim he didn't know that Booker was walking out as the WCW champion when people like Meltzer somehow knew? The night before the show, he knew the night before the pay-per-view that Hogan was being stripped and Booker was leaving with the belt. Meltzer was on the old live audio wrestling show with Jeff Merrick the night before. Both of them were openly talking about all of this. So if they knew, then that means other people had to know. And we're supposed to believe that Eric Bischoff, who's directly involved in all of this, had no prior knowledge of any of this? Hogan goes on and takes legal action against Russo. He files a lawsuit over this against Russo and WCW for defamation and breach of contract. Russo notes the judge laughed it out of court because it was a wrestling show with a guy in a wrestling ring cutting a wrestling promo against another wrestler. 
Russo says he was cutting his promo in character on the Hulk Hogan character. He was not cutting a promo on Terry Bollea. He says the first judge threw out the case. He went to a different judge. And that's when they found out in Discovery that Hogan's lawyer had sent a fax to the WCW offices on, on the Friday before. And this was after the offices were closed. Uh, that he was exercising his creative control. Russo said he had no idea. So the appeals court rules in Hogan's, uh, or rather in Russo's favor, again, because they rule that fictional characters cannot be defamed. Jarrett claims that Hogan decided that night that he wanted another check from Time Warner because he knew they weren't going to renew his contract, so he filed the lawsuit, and that's why he did what he did. Dave says that Hogan became the face of failure in WCW, and there was really nothing left to do with him. Eric goes off on Meltzer, which is his favorite pastime, and that, you know, the you know hate that Dave has for Hogan still extends to this very day, and Bischoff noted that Turner ended up settling. The amount was kept confidential, but he knows it was well into the seven figures, because I'm sure he and Hogan discussed it. Jarrett notes that some people play checkers, other people play chess, which is what Hulk Hogan did. He said Hogan had the patience to play chess, and then he cashed out. He says it was an egotistical, self-centered power play that benefited Hulk. The only good thing to come out of any of this, this, this entire fiasco, was Booker T becoming the WCW World Champion. Unfortunately for Booker, his run came in the dying days. But it elevated him enough that when he went to WWE, he was one of the few big names. It was really he and DDP that were, you know, able to go over and sign. They made the decision to forego guaranteed money. They gave that up to go sign a contract with WWE. And he ended up wrestling The Rock that year in the main event of SummerSlam. But then Vince McMahon swoops in. He buys WCW. He picks the bones. After Bischoff's group, his investment group that he was leading, the deal fell through. Eric says they were going to pay $67 million for all the assets, including the TV time slots. Vince McMahon ends up paying $2.5 million for WCW, another $1.7 million for the tape library, which by this point, you know, that library has paid for itself many times over. And then Russo says, I, I don't hate any of these people. It was a job. And when people ask me about getting into the wrestling business, bro, I tell them don't. That, that was uh, Vince Russo's parting shot. There were so many stories and contradictions being tossed around here. I don't trust any of these people. Whose version sounds the most accurate? I might side slightly with Russo over Bischoff, but honestly... I'll steal a line from Jerry Lawler, who I'm sure stole this from some other comedian, but he used to say it on commentary. I wouldn't trust these people if their tongues were notarized. Imagine the judge being the judge having to hear that defamation suit with grown men arguing about the finish to a fucking wrestling match in a court of law. <laughs> it's nonsensical. The defamation portion of the suit was dismissed. That got Russo off the hook. Hogan ended up settling on the breach of contract portion. I think it was in 2005, so he got something out of it. Russo, though, had his legal bills paid by Time Warner. In exchange, he wasn't allowed to work for another wrestling promotion. He got that provision waived when Vince McMahon rehired him in 2002. That lasted all of a week, if that. But it did pave the way for him to end up signing with TNA. And they could do a whole other episode dedicated just to Vince Russo and TNA. In fact, I would throw that out as a suggestion to Evan and Jason for Season 5. Vince Russo and TNA could be a two-parter. 